Okay. Uh, next, I want to introduce Peterson Tos Toscano. I think when you're done listening to him, you'll um, be as happy about CCL Radio as I am. Uh, that is Peterson's project now, and uh, we couldn't be happier about it. Um, Peterson is a comic storyteller who explores gender, sexuality, faith, and climate change. <laughs> they all naturally go together, right? <laughs> As someone who is concerned with human rights, Toscano has made climate change his primary focus as he considers climate change an LGBT issue, a matter of faith and a human rights concern. His message does not dole out gloom or sh shame and guilt. Global warming message, excuse me, boy, whew, bad reading skills. His message does not now dole out gloom or shame and guilt regarding global warming issues. Instead, he infuses his her work with hope. He challenges audiences to pursue community building, creative solutions, and storytelling. And please join me in welcoming Peterson Toscano. Troublemakers, how are you? This is my fourth CCL conference. It's a much bigger room than the first one, and a lot more people. And I'm wondering, like, where did you all come from? At, at North Carolina. So a lot of places. <laughs> you know, I'm a, I'm a storyteller. I'm interested in stories. And I'm also interested in, like, where do you come from in that how did you get here? You know, like, for some people, maybe this was a natural progression to land in CCL. But then there's this whole other demographic of people where it's like, how did that happen? Like, it's weird, right? Like, I mean, I have friends. This is my fourth conference. I put it on my social media. And they think it's really strange that I'm here. I mean, they really, I think, genuinely think I'm in some sort of cult. <laughs> um, because as, as Mark said in my intro, I, you know, I do lots of disparate things. I mean, uh, you know, for the past uh, 13 years, I've been doing public speaking. I'm a Bible scholar, actually, and I do lectures at seminaries throughout North America and in Europe. Um, I'm also a comic, uh, and I do comic storytelling sometimes about the Bible, because there's some funny stuff in the Bible. <laughs> Uh, and I'm also very concerned with uh, LGBTQ rights, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer rights. And I'm not an environmentalist. I, I mean, nothing against environmentalists. It's just never been my jam. You know, it's like never been, I've never been part of a group or anything. So my friends think it, it's really weird that I'm here. And I have to blame Glenn Retief, who is my husband, for this. Because like many people, it's through a relationship that I found out about climate change, um, about CSCL in particular. I came home one day to find Glenn in the bedroom, on the bed, weeping. Now, Glenn is not a weeper. Okay, I'm the weeper in the family. That's how we set it up, right? And so I'm perplexed. I'm like, I don't know what to do with this situation. And he's originally from South Africa. His family's still there. And I thought, oh, crap, we got some bad news. What's, you know, so I said, what's, what's the matter? What's going on? And he points to an article in the New, in the New Yorker magazine. And he says, it's, it's climate change. I was like, climate change? What do we have to do with climate change? He, I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, yeah, it's, things are worse than they had imagined, and things are happening quicker than they expected, and um, we need to do something about it. And like, what do you do? Like, someone's, you know, freaking out. I was just like, they're there. <laughs> I was like, I don't know, we'll do research. We'll, you know, we'll find out more. We'll join a group or something. So Glenn went off and did the research, and he is a master researcher. He came back several weeks later with his findings, and he said, okay, this is what we need to do. We need to make sure that we put a fee on carbon and collect that money and have it be returned as a dividend to households. 
And he said, I found a group that's doing this. It's called Citizens Climate Lobby. We need to join them. Did I marry the right guy? Well, my response was, it sounds really boring. <laughs> he says, well, it is the most elegant solution to address this problem. And I was like, I like elegance. So I was like, okay, let's, let's do that. But then I began my independent research into climate change, because it's still, I wasn't like hooked into the issue really, like he was. And, and the, the problem was the traditional talking points didn't work for me, all right? Like the, you know, like the, think of the polar bears. That just ran right off my back. I have nothing against polar bears. It just didn't move me. Similarly, when people say, well, we need to do it for the children and the grandchildren, future generations, and I don't have any of those. <laughs> I have nothing against them. I just don't have any DNA in the game, you know? <laughs> so I'm like, what else you got? <laughs> so I had to do my own research. You know, I'm reading articles, I'm doing all this stuff, and then one day I read that article. And I think many of you have that experience, right? You, you heard one thing, you read one thing, and that was the thing that just got you. It was an article about drought. I was reading about drought and the effects of drought and, and all of the things that will happen on a warming planet with more drought. So there'll be food uh, security problems. There'll be famine. There'll be uh, mass migrations. There'll be political instability. There'll be conflicts, things that we are actually already seeing on the planet. And that was like, I was like, wow, that's really interesting. I didn't think of that. And then towards the end of the article was the bit. The, for me, the silver bullet that just shot right through my heart. They said, and because of this increase in drought, we will see crop failures, including potential failures in wheat production, leading to mass shortages of pasta. <laughs> I'm Italian American, okay? And I was like, Oh my God, this is serious. We've got to do something about it. And, and I wish it were just a joke I just made up for tonight, but that is actually what happened. Sure, famines, all that, but pasta? I mean, I'm not gluten-free. So I got involved. Uh, I, but 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 I had that's when I had my moment. You know that like that uh, when the Greek word in the Bible it's an apocalypse. I had an apocalypse, a revelation, as if you see something that's been hidden from sight and it jars you awake, and it, it moves you to the point where you can't unsee it. And so I entered this sort of catatonic state that many of us go into, like we got to do something. And shortly after that, um, Glenn set up our first meeting with CCL to get trained as, um, as leaders of a group because he sucked me into that. He said, we need to start a group here. We live in central Pennsylvania in Amish country. And I'm like, we're two gay guys. What are we going to do? He said, we're going to go down to Lancaster, Pennsylvania and meet with John Clark. John Clark is going to help us out. I was like, OK. So I arrive at this little church, and, uh, and Jerry and Susan Miller were there, and, and uh, you know, I was like, this seems really straight, and um, I'm like, they're nice, though, but, and I'm, I'm freaking out, and, and John Clark comes to me, and he says, oh, and he's, and, you know, I don't know if you've ever met John Clark, he is just such a mild-mannered, sweet, gentle, shy kind of person. It is stunning, actually, when I see how much he stepped outside of himself to talk to people, to write all these letters and everything. It's really, really such a testimony how he pushed himself. So he comes to me and in his very gentle way and he says, so I hear you're really struggling with climate change? I'm freaking out here, man. We got to do something. He said, I understand. But, you know, it's OK because I've got good news for you. I'm like, well, what? Because I'm like, I need some good news. He says, well, let me ask you a couple of questions. I said, OK, OK, what? He said, OK, have you ever heard of Marshall Saunders before? And I'm like, I don't know. Wasn't that like a store that like, like, like shut down or something? Marshall's something. He says, no. He says, Marshall Saunders is a man, an amazing man. And he looked deep in my eyes and he says, and Marshall Saunders? has a plan for your life.
I was like, really? He said, yeah. No, did you, he asked me, did you get the materials that I forwarded to you? He always, because he always has materials. I said, oh, well, I don't know. Yes, I sent you some materials. I sent you um, the, the gospel according to Danny Richter. <laughs> a special section on the Remy Report. I also sent you the epistles of the CCL saints. Um, now, now, these letters to editors are ascribed to many CCL uh, members, but actually um, many of them were written by a Jewish rabbi. <laughs> I was like, I don't, I don't know. I don't think I got those things. I'm like, I'm freaking out. I said, it's okay. You can relax because right now, somewhere in the Midwest, Madeline Para is interceding on your behalf. <laughs> I was like, she is? He says, so I just have one simple question for you. Just one question. Would you like to receive Mark Reynolds into your heart as your personal <laughs> climate savior and overlord? I was like, what? Oh, he said, I'm sorry, would you like to join CCL? I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll do that, sure, that's fine. <laughs> so I got sucked in. <laughs> so then I took a year off of performance. I'm a performance artist, I'm a speaker, and I took a year off, because I was like, I need to know about climate change. And my dad had actually passed away um, about a year before, and I said, I'm gonna take some of my dad's inheritance that he gave me, and I want to invest it in the future. Um, he, my dad loved nature, he loved animals, and I said, um, I wanna do this. So I took a year off to study not only climate science, but also climate communication. Like, what's working, what's not working? And after all that research, I had my coming out party, which was the, um, the People's Climate March, or I like to call it the People's Pride, Climate Pride Parade. <laughs> That's when I came out for climate. And I launched um, a, a podcast called Climate Stew. It's the show that takes a serious look at global warming, but doesn't try to scare the snot out of you. <laughs> and it was a way of just using comedy and storytelling and interviews to help people get closer to this issue that they're really afraid about. And after doing many episodes of it, um, I got word from CCL that um, they, they were listening and they were interested. And so I've got an announcement tonight that, um, that I retired, I ended uh, my Climate Stew podcast, 50 episodes, which are available on iTunes that you can listen to, great interviews and all. But for a week from today, next Monday, we will premiere an absolutely brand new podcast called Citizens Climate Radio. And this is a program for you. This is a program to encourage you, to equip you with tools that you need, amazing interviews with staff members and other people to talk about the things that we talk about in conferences. In a way, it's gonna be like an audio version of a conference downloaded into your phone or your computer. Um, and if you go in your program um, on page nine, there's actually a little ad for Citizens Climate Radio right there. I'm um, telling everything of what it's all about. And so like next week when you listen to it, there's gonna be some music that comes on. So my tech people, could I have a little of that music come on? And, and you'll hear this like music and then you'll hear my voice saying something like, hello, are you there? Is anyone listening? Oh, there you are. Welcome to Citizens Climate Radio. In this podcast, we highlight people's stories. We celebrate your successes. And together, we share strategies for talking about climate change. I'm your host, Peterson Toscano. Congratulations. You made it to the very first episode of Citizens Climate Radio, a project of the Citizens Climate Education. And in every show, there'll be a great interview or a segment where someone will, will share something. I've got, um, I, we spent two days in a little hot studio interviewing people um, the past two days. Um, there also will be a climate puzzler, a citizen's climate puzzler at the end of every show. And this is a chance for you to get interactive. We're gonna have a conundrum, a situation that you might find yourself in, and we're asking listeners to give in your response, your thoughts of what it could be. So like the, the climate puzzler, puzzler for the first show is going to be this. It's you're at a party and you're having this great conversation with this person. Her name is Claire. And Claire hears that you're interested in climate change. 
And she looks at you and she says, yeah, I hear what you're saying. I mean, I'm concerned about climate change too, but you know, really though, I think, you know, there are bigger issues that we need to take on. <laughs> How would you answer Claire in a way that you actually are opening up a conversation and not just like slamming her to the ground? Um, there is going to be, uh, there's a call line, a listener call line where you can leave a voicemail with what you would say to Claire um, or an email and I will share the best responses with uh, listeners and check in with experts on what are some of the best ways of answering. Also, and I'm so grateful that Diego showed the film because I think art is such an important part of our climate communication. Yes. My husband, Glenn, who um, is always at the conference, just arrived this morning from visiting his family in South Africa, and so he is a fast asleep tonight, and he will be lobbying with us tomorrow, but he told me that when he was in college, part of the anti-apartheid movement, they understood something very important. They knew that with all the films and the, and the songs and the art, they knew that once the artist got involved, that's when they knew they were winning. That's when they had hope. And, and art is an amazing way of just helping us come closer to this issue. So there'll be an art section. And so I want to end with a little monologue, because I'm a character actor. And I want to do a little monologue I wrote just for tonight. Um, and it's something that you might recognize. When I first learned about climate change, I went through various stages of understanding and action. And so this is what I call the um, five stages of hot climate action. And since I have multiple voices that reside in my head, I'm going to use a different character to help kind of clarify what each of these stages look like. Now, for some of you, you may recognize these stages as your own. So I found out about pasta as a potentially endangered species, <laughs> and I freaked out. So what does freak out look like? Oh crap, global warming is going to crush us. We gotta do something, this is huge. Droughts, floods, pestilence, whatever that is. Famine, instability, and maybe worst of all, the possible extinction of coffee. So after freaking out, I, I, I began to actually toy for just a tiny little bit with denial. I never denied it, but I just thought, well, maybe. And this is what toying with denial sounded like for me. Oh, yes, I am concerned about the climate change, of course, but, uh, but perhaps it won't be a catastrophe. I, I mean, well, Siberia can use some warming, yes? I mean, we don't know everything yet. I read something somewhere. Uh, maybe they will invent something. This could just be another Y2K. But then the guilt started to come in. Because I was like, oh my gosh, I'm actually part of the problem here. I'm, you know, consuming fossil fuels. So then I went through the personal purge. It's familiar to anybody? Trying to clean up your ecological lifestyle. So this is what the personal purge was like. So I changed all my light bulbs. Okay, so like I bought the really super expensive, efficient ones. Um, and then I stopped drying my clothes in the dryer partly because I couldn't afford to run it anymore after all those light bulbs. <laughs> and then after this radical vegan activist with really bad breath screamed at me, I became a vegetarian for about a week. <laughs> but then the despair hit. Because I realized that like, even if I did all of that, does it really make a difference? And this is my despair voice. But what difference does it all make? I did all that. No one around me seemed to care. And even if they did lower their own personal footprints, carbon footprints in the sand, it's like a teardrop in the ocean, which is quickly acidifying. <laughs> the very roads they build for us are soaked in fossil fuels. The whole infrastructure is out of my control. What could I possibly do? It's like the trials of Job. Just curse God and die. <laughs> my despair is very biblical, I don't know. But then something wonderful happened. Then I met you. 
no, I'm not making this up. <laughs> and uh, then came the stage of engagement and hope. And for me, this is what that sounds like. But we live in extraordinary times. <laughs> unprecedented, with so much uncertainty, dangers, and fears. But this is not our first rodeo. <laughs> our ancestors faced myriad challenges together. The Great Depression, World War II, they learned an important truth that we are discovering today. We are not alone. We have each other to comfort, to encourage, to bind our voices together. And together, dear friends, we shall do the extraordinary. Thank you so much. Thank you.